Well, hi, people. We are going to uh, really only talk about 50 years this time. We're going to talk about the beginning of the 19th century. So uh, we're going to talk about three. These three periods have some specific names. So we're talking about um, the French Revolution, the Directory period, the Empire period, which is the post French Revolution, and then an overarching what is known as the Romantic period, which really includes England uh, and most of Europe. And of course, in this period, we're going to talk about the our, our, our new country, the United States. At this point, we had only, uh, we had just barely been a quarter of a century old. Um, so we were still establishing ourselves. We will talk about, um, we will talk about the differentiation between dress in the Americas, including that of indigenous folks and of um, of, of, I'd say, my enslaved ancestors. Okay, what's going on in the world, right? There's a, a handful of things that are happening in the world. Um, I prefaced it in the, in the previous slide. So France um, is coming out of, um, is, is coming out of the reign of the Louise and, um, it is embroiled in the French Revolution. Um, that is really the biggest crisis they have. We're going to talk about French Revolution in, in a few slides. I'm not going to go too deep into it here. Um, England, on the other hand, has a, um, a, a king that has died. So King George has, has died um, and left um, the Prince of Wales, um, has left... Uh, a son that is not of age. Um, so in England, this, this period is, is known as, as the Regency, as a Regency period. And um, interestingly enough, at, in this point in time, the English court transforms into what the French court had been before it gets to the revolution. And, you know, English court, you know, in the, in the first, you know, 20 years of this century uh, turned into you know, the pleasure palace, right? The pursuit of pleasure and, you know, a king that has an eye for the ladies and just, uh, you know, his goal is just to be clever and witty. And he actually um, had the informal title of the first gentleman of Europe. So at this point, um, his court became the center of fashion in England, which is a, it's, it's divergent from where the English court had been. Uh, in the past, the English court had gotten all of their cues from the French. And that was not the case this time. Uh, English style um, was was different, was divergent from, from French style. Um, so really, you know, while the French were wearing, were narrowing their silhouettes, we're going to see an image in, in a minute of, of Empress um, of Empress um, Josephine, I almost said Justine, Empress Josephine, we'll see an image in a minute, um, that has a much slimmer silhouette. You know, English plays a padded roll under a waist under their waistline, so they want to have a fuller, rounded line of the skirt. So, you know, um, there, there is, are, there's some rationale that, you know, France and England were at war, um, so there was not the free-flowing, you know, trade and visiting of folks from court and uh, not being able to get many French designs, textiles, ideas from from the French. So some of the, some of that uh, definitely had to do had to do with it, right? And then our brand new country, right, the United States, uh, was just really starting its its major expansion uh, westward uh, to the frontier, and that expansion did bring you know Native American and European populations into uh, frequent frequent contact and um, you know European set settlers, American and European settlers uh, adapted some of the items that Native Americans um, wore. Um, and again, we've been talking about that intercultural exchange. Um, they they did that as well. And you know the reasoning for doing that is because the Native Americans, the indigenous people. Um, they knew what to wear in the frontier, right? So, you know, the footwear of Native Americans and boots and moccasins were were adopted. Um, you know, 
deer and moose skins, um, you know, things that were constructed from from sturdy animal hides that could be used and cleaned and were durable and that were, were long, were long lasting. So, you know, rural settlers and um, the Canadian military even adopted some of the um, some of the dress um, that that Native Americans wore, I'm sorry, that indigenous people uh, wore and really just adapted a form of Native American, I'm going to, I'm I'm working on my, on my, on my right words, on indigenous peoples, on indigenous peoples dress. So, um, so yes, the United States um, did adopt some of those, but for the upper class, it really did parallel uh, what was what was being worn in in Europe, and in part because this is also a period of time where we had ma- mass immigration, where we really just had an open border, um, and if you could get here, you could come, you could stay here, right? You can get here and become a citizen. You know, the United States at this point uh, had no immigration laws. We actually didn't have any immigration laws um, on the books uh, until a much later period, and. Um, you know, our government wanted people to come here. We need, we had all this space. We had a whole continent that we needed to fill up. So um, immigration definitely brought um, a change in what Americans were because we were at that, that time, we were that melting pot, right? The people come in, they bring their thing and they add to the American experience. So immigration uh, did that well, did that as well. Okay, so I told you I was going to talk about the French Revolution, and um, you know how I feel about (laughs) the history part. I want to tell too much, but I'm not. I'm going to do the whole French Revolution in one slide just based on clothing, but I have to give you a little bit of the background, right? So so why did the French Revolution happen, right? So social, political, economic grievances, um, you know, high unemployment, high prices, a bankrupt government, all those things made France really ripe for revolution. That's not not to mention, you know, the ineffectiveness of of the monarchy. And you know, unfortunately, the the lower middle class, the, not even the lower middle class, the peasants, right? The peasants bore the heaviest load of just unjust taxation. Um, they just were taxed beyond measure. I, I can't even explain uh, how, how heavily they were taxed. Um, but the leadership actually of the revolution um, really belonged to the urban bourgeoisie. So it really belonged to folks that lived in the city that were of a merchant class, of a middle class, that weren't connected to court, right? That saw the ostentatiousness of the court. They were taxed heavily as well. Um, not as much as the peasants, but they had enough freedom that even though they were heavily taxed that they could think about something other than how am I going to eat today right um, and the urban bourgeoisie needed they needed the peasants to be their army right they were a small yet vocal group but they could not have fought a revolution and won against the French army without the peasants so we the image that we see here we see we see that bourgeoisie. I'm gonna explain their outfits in a second. Uh, we see the peasants that are really, you know, leading the ban- the banner, um, and then we see the army, the the real army that decided to go against the king in, in the background. So there actually were uh, dress codes, not, not not just codes. They were um, laws, a set of ad- ceremonial instructions of what folks had to war and which level that they were seen at in 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 higher in, in the hierarchy of the social the social statuses, right? So um the clergy, you know, were required to wear their traditional dress based on their ecclesiastical position. So um, you know, aristocrats, we see them here in the center, aristocrats um, wore black silk coats and waistcoats. Often they were, you know, trimmed in gold braid. Uh, they wore black uh, breeches, which we see here. Um, 
they wore lace cravats so you know with the thing that we see around their neck that's folded over it's lace right um and um they also wore hats with a feather in it um which was known as the order of the saint Esprit. so just the spirit of the people that's what the hat with the feather um that's what the hat with the feather denoted we're going to talk about what regular what the what the red hats that are that are in there um means as well and then generally you know this class um also carries swords right the largest group of individuals really everybody else anybody from the um you know the middle class uh, down to the peasants um really just dress simply um, often they wore suits of black cloth and black caps, black stockings, um, and then the three corner hats. Um, they weren't permitted to wear to wear swords. But the general estate, that's what was known as as the, the, the everyday people. We see them, we see them here, and we see them in what what they wear. Um, you know, when we look at this image as well, we see um, some obvious symbols of of the revolution so we see men here uh, in the center in their black we see them wearing um, a, a, a sash that is uh, the colors of the French flag actually it's just if you take those colors and expand it, the French flag looks just like that it's a stripe of red a stripe of white a stripe of blue um, we also see men wearing um, Culottes, which uh, culotte, uh, hopefully you know that word, right? Culotte is just a French word for knee breeches. And for many, many generations, men in the laboring classes wore trousers, while the nobility and more affluent wore knee breeches. So the change in clothing was also revolutionary. So um, working class men who supported the revolution. Um, wore wore trousers um and that was known as being sans culotte so meaning without without the knee breeches um but um culottes is what uh the the everyday working class wore and you see you see it here you also see them wearing um the the bonnet rouge the the red hat right um which became synonymous with synonymous with the revolution and you know sources um state that the cap had some roman origins and the revolutionaries believe that the cap had been worn in greece and rome as a symbol of freedom um or a rallying cry for those who hated despotism we don't know that for sure but that is what the hat became to symbolize in in the revolution so you know whatever the origins of the cap was it was a widely used symbol um it was a widely used symbol of of the revolution it was also known as the the cap of liberty so what I, what i failed to mention in the in the previous slide uh on the french revolution is that ultimately what happened with the re revolution the king was tried and executed um in in 1793 and um you know there was a reign of terror what was a, what was known as uh an effort to save the nation um from from defeat so there was a, a brief period where kind of nobody was in charge like the two battling forces were in in charge so those that were um, that executed the king and those who um wanted to keep the king in power and ultimately what the French Revolution did is it opened a gateway for uh, Napoleon Bonaparte. So by the end of the French Revolution, he was a brigadier general. And by the time that we get to the beginning of this century, um, he was a, he was a hero in, in Paris and he was part of a, a, a group um, of, of councils that ruled that ruled France and ultimately um, he consolidated his, his power and was ruled um, crown emperor in 18, 1804. So um, for the next decade or so, Napoleon instituted legal and educational reforms and he reorganized the government and he made it more efficient and more competent and more honest, which the people appreciated. 
Um, he extended the control of France over most of Europe, with the exception of Great Britain. Um, and then, uh, you know, by 1812, he um, had exerted his, his control so much that he decided to take on Russia. And if you know anything about European history, you will know that you can never win a war in Russia in the winter. <laughs> and it's like a military tactic to not go to Russia in the fall because you're going to get bogged down in the winter. Your supply lines are going to get cut. Your army is going to uh, starve or freeze or starve while they are freezing and they will they will die. But ultimately, he, he didn't make it. He, he didn't make it uh, and he retreated as well. But, you know, in this period, the styles um, that men and women wore, um, you know, uh, continued. Actually, it was it was a slightly it was a slimming of the silhouette. So if we look at the image here, this is an image of Empress Josephine, who was Napoleon's uh, Napoleon's wife. Uh, and um, if you see, it, it's a it's a more slimming style. So Napoleon uh, really was conservative, and he considered um, some of the styles of the Versailles, you know, right, of the period before the, of the, of the court of Versailles, he, um, he's, he considered them immoral and he really attempted to recreate an elegance, uh, in, in the court and his, um, court of, of course was a stage. Um, so if we look at, at Empress Josephine's, um, you know, her coronation regalia, um, it's elaborate. It's a different type of ostentation than we saw when we were looking at Versailles, right? So her silhouette is very, it's very slim. I mean, it's reminiscent of just a chemise with a, 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 a cloak over it. Um, the chemise was probably silk, right? Um, it is a very thick belt, a bit thick embroidered gold trim velvet. The underside of it is definitely fur. Um, what we see kind of almost like prickly at her shoulders um, is is lace. Um, we see that the, the sleeve is puff, but then very tight. Um, but it, this is very different than what we saw in, in the previous periods when we look at, we look at Versailles. Um, Napoleon really tried to encourage, you know, um, French to buy French, to buy French goods. So he it restricted the importation of fabrics from abroad and um, particularly, you know, muslins and printed cot cottons from, from India. And he ended the importation, but then he ordered that they be copied in France, right? So um, even though his wife, old Josephine, was getting stuff snuck in from the black market, so she was still buying stuff um, imported, right? So, um, so this did stimulate French industry um, because, um, you know, people want to dress like her and her inventory, um, there's an inventory of her clothing in 1809 that included 666 winter dresses and 230 summer dresses and 60 cashmere shawls, which is amazing. So you have 666 winter dresses and there are not even 300 days in in the winter, it's not even too, I mean, it's only 365 days in a year, right? So winter is only about a quarter of those days. So she had enough dresses to not wear anything twice for three winters and more than that for a couple when she could change a couple, three, three, four times a day. So um, Napoleon as well had an extensive, extensive wardrobe. I, um, underneath this part of the lecture, I have an inventory of his wardrobe, which is unbelievable. So we'll, we'll look at We'll look at that when you finish um, viewing this part of the lecture.